This is Tom Cold Export and in this video we are reviewing the ASRock B550M Pro 4 which is a really feature rich M80X motherboard. So let's first unbox it, there is nothing overly exciting in the box, just a manual with a driver CD and a couple of M.2 screws inside along with an ASRock badge. You also get four SATA cables and the board itself, of course, and a shiny I.O. shield, which is not pre-installed. I'm not able to do VRM testing as I don't have anything more power hungry than an R5 3600 and this board does not support first and second gen Ryzen chips. I tried with the 2700X but it would not post and just lights up the CPU and DRAM debug LEDs. Uh, so the vCore VRM does appear to be a six-phase design with MOSFETs rather than power stages and it has a decently sized heatsink which also partly functions as an I.O. cover. Speaking of I.O., the, on the rear we have no less than seven Type-A USB ports and a single USB Type-C port. We have two USB 2.0 ports on top of a PS2 port and we have one USB Type-A and one USB Type-C 3.2 Gen 2 port. Uh, the remaining four ports are Type-A and USB 3.2 Gen 1. This is a good rare I.O. for an ATX board and rivals some ATX boards as well, actually. It's only outdone by some Gigabyte boards. Uh, in fact, the ATX version of the Pro 4 has less feature than this, and usually it's the other way around, so that's interesting. We also have a Gigabit Ethernet port powered by a Realtek 8111H NIC. You get three audio jacks on the rear, uh, no optical on this board, but it is powered by an ALC 1200 Realtek uh, codec, so performance should be good. On the other end, we have a bracket for Wi-Fi antennas if you want to add a Wi-Fi card. Then there are one HDMI 2.1 port, one display port, uh, version 1.4, and a VGA port of all things. Moving on to the onboard headers, we find the usual two USB 2.0 headers and two USB 3.2 Gen 1 headers, which is slightly unusual for a B550 board, so nice job ASRock. I believe one of those headers is connected with an AS Media Hub, so it doesn't come directly from the chipset. And there's no USB Type-C headers on this board. We do have a front panel audio header, of course, as is usual, and then there is one RGB header and one addressable RGB header by the bottom of the motherboard, and another set near the top right of the board. We also get a clear CMOS jumper, uh, this, the position is a bit unfortunate if you want to hook up your reset switch to it, because your front panel cables might not reach it. Uh, I have a separate button I connect when overclocking memory, so there are ways around this, of course. We also have a header for speaker and power LED, which is right next to the front panel headers, which also includes a power LED, so that was a bit weird, but let's move on. The board comes with six SATA ports, which is surprising for an M80X board. And this is a full M80X board, so we do get four DIMM slots, which support memory speed up to 4533 MHz or mega transfers. Uh, with a 3rd gen Ryzen CPU or a Zen 2 CPU or 4733 MHz with the new Renoir APUs. However, when looking at the memory QVL, there are no kits that are validated at these speeds, so why they are rating it this high, I do not know. I did test it with my BDI dominators and managed to reach 4400 MHz without much effort. Couldn't go any further though, but I didn't, I didn't really think with it too much. On a 3rd gen Ryzen CPU, 3800 MHz is the max speed you will ever need anyway, so it should be good enough. This board comes with two M.2 slots, well, technically three, which is nice, but uh, the top one gets a heatsink and is connected to the CPU with support for PCIe 4.0, but it is also fully compatible with PCIe 3.0 SSDs as well. The placement is a bit unfortunate because it's directly below the GPU, which means that the GPU will heat up the SSD when you are gaming. It's not too much to worry about though, because it won't get dangerously warm, as we will see later on. The second M.2 slot doesn't get a heatsink and is only PCIe 3.0 and not only is it limited to PCIe 3.0, it actually only gets two PCIe 3.0 lanes, which means it's limited to 2GB of bandwidth and this will hamper the sequential speed of some of the faster SSDs on the market, but most of the time you are not writing or reading really large files, so I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Uh, but there is some more bad news, M.2 slot shares lanes with the SATA port 5 and 6, which means when you install an SSD in this slot, SATA 5 and 6 will be disabled, leaving you with 4 SATA ports. 
The last M.2 slot is for a Wi-Fi card, so you will not have to sacrifice a USB port or a PCIe slot for that. The top PCIe slot is PCIe 4.0 and is connected directly to the CPU, so this is the location you will want to install your graphics card. The second slot is a PCIe 3.0 slot with a single lane with the appropriate length, and the last full length slot is only wired up for four PCIe 3.0 lanes. The board also has a generous amount of fan headers, uh, I counted a total of 6 fan headers and all but the CPU fan headers support up to 2 amps or 24 watts power draw. Uh, but uh, let's move on to the testing. So we start off with audio testing using Rightmark Audio Analyzer. I'm comparing this board to uh, ASRock X470 Tai Chi and MSI B350 Tomahawk and a Gigabyte Aura C490 Elite AC. Here we have nose floor, total harmonic distortion stereo chorus talk and dynamic range and all of this looks acceptable at all parameters it's not quite as good as the c490 elite ac which uses the same audio codec and it's not quite on par with the tai chi's audio but this is definitely a pass and a good result at that from my listening test i used a pair of sennheiser's hd 559s nothing fancy and a hyperx cloud headset and there were no issues with background noise when gaming or doing other tasks that leverage the GPU heavy, which can be an issue on lower end boards. Now let's take a look to see if that M.2 heatsink actually works. We start off with numbers with the GPU at idle. So without the heatsink, the Corsair MP510 reached 65C, and with the heatsink, that dropped by 10 degrees Celsius. Idle temps remain the same though. So let's see what happens when we load out the GPU. At idle, the heatsink is now keeping the SSD 8 degrees Celsius cooler than without the heatsink. And when the SSD was put under load, that decreases to 4 degrees, reaching 66 degrees Celsius. Next is the throughput test of the onboard LAN. It performs better than the B450M Gaming Plus, which uses the same onboard LAN chip. Uh, but it's not quite as good as the 2.5 gig Realtek LAN on the C490 Elite AC, nor is it as good as the Intel LAN on the X470 Tai Chi, but uh, you won't really have a problem with it for everyday use, it's going to be perfectly fine. So to sum up, the ASRock B550M Pro 4 is a micro ATX board packed with features that will put the feature set of some of the low-end ATX boards to shame, and for that it is recommended. At the time of testing, the lowest price on PC Part Picker was 115 US dollars at Amazon. Unfortunately, though, it was out of stock, and at BH, the price is the same as the B450 Tomahawk Max, which has less connectivity and a smaller VRM. However, if you want support for all generations of AMD CPUs, a B450 board or a used X470 board is probably your best bet. Looking at some other MATX B550 boards around the same price, we have the Gigabyte B550 MDS3H, which is cheaper and still has a decent feature set, but the VRM and audio solution does not appear to be of the same quality as this board. Uh, it should still be fine with the R5600. The deal breaker for me is that it only has a single USB 2.0 internal header, which means you have to choose to either have your front panel USB connected, assuming you have that, or your AIO. So that might not matter for you though, but uh, it does for me. And it has no USB-C ports at all, no header and no USB-C ports at the rear. Again, it might not matter for you, but I actually use USB-C quite a lot, so it does for me. A slightly more expensive alternative is the Gigabyte Aorus B550M Pro. This board has a beefier VRM, it has more USB ports at the rear I.O. and it has optical audio out, which you might care about. It does have one less USB 3.2 Gen 1 internal header, but uh, probably won't be a problem because most people only use one. It uses the same audio codec, but the second M.2 slot actually runs with four PCIe 3.0 lanes instead of the two on the B550 Pro 4, which means you will get maximum speed from your PCIe 3.0 SSDs. In my opinion, if you're going with a 3rd gen Ryzen CPU or the upcoming 4th gen, getting a B550 board seems like a good idea. Uh, this one is cheaper than the B450 Tomahawk with an extra M.2 slot, superior VRM more and more USB ports. So it's a real shame it's not backwards compatible with the previous Ryzen CPUs, but for most buyers it probably doesn't matter, because if you're buying this along with the new CPU it's probably going to be a 3rd gen CPU. 
I would not recommend the ATX version of the Pro 4 because it has it does have an extra PCI 3.0 slot that's a single lane, but it has less USB ports for some reason, and they also removed the display port, and you have one less USB 3.2 Gen 1 internal header. The soldering pads are there, but the header is missing. And you have the same VRM with what looks like the same heatsink and no heatsink for the SoC VRM. And despite all this, the board actually costs more than the MX ATX version, which is just wrong. But yeah, that's my opinion anyway. And that's it from me for now. Thank you so much for watching and uh, farewell for now.